Thank you very much for being here today. It's so nice to see a sellout audience for uh, another of our Living History programs to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy this November. Uh, as Nicholas said, I'm Stephen Fagan and I uh, manage our ongoing oral history project here at the museum. Uh, since this institution opened, we've recorded close to 1,100 individual recordings, people from around the world remembering where they were when the assassination took place and articulating what President Kennedy, the assassination, and the president's legacy mean to them. Uh, if you'd like to become part of this archive of history, uh, you can contact us via our website at uh, jfk.org, and we'd be happy to schedule an appointment uh, here on site if you live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area or uh, via telephone for our friends from out of town, and we'd be happy to add you to this collection. Uh, in managing the oral history project, I find that occasionally an outstanding storyteller emerges, and when that happens, we like to invite those special guests back to the museum to share their story in a forum like this. And this is what living history is all about, and that's why we're here today. Uh, when you came in today, you should have been given a question card. I anticipate we'll have a lot of questions for our guests today. Uh, if you would, fill those out and have them ready, and later on in the program, I'll ask you to uh, pass those to the end of your rows. We'll collect them and go through as many as we can in the in the hour we have today and also please make sure your cell phones are silenced uh, this is being recorded and with that I want to welcome our very special guest today Buell Wesley Frazier who uh, as I'm sure all of you know was uh, employed here at the Texas School Book Depository in 1963 and drove uh, a fellow employee Lee Harvey Oswald to work several times but uh, uh, particularly on the day of the assassination of November 22nd 1963 please join me in welcoming Buell to tell his story Story today. <laughs> Buell, welcome back to the Texas School Book Depository. Fifty years since you were first hired. You were uh, hired in September of 1963, is that right? That is correct. Um, you were hired as an order filler, and I'd like you to get us started today by telling us exactly what an order filler does and give us a sense of just how the Texas School Book Depository Company operated out of this building. Okay. Um, when I would report into work, um, I would go over, we had boxes, small boxes, oh, about the size of, not much larger than a uh, sheet of typing paper because the, uh, the orders came off the printers up on the second floor and uh, someone would take them off the printer and they would bring them downstairs. Mr. Shelley, my supervisor, would go over them and then he would put them in the boxes according to the publishers, where it was uh, Scott's Foreman, Southwestern, Greg, whatever. And, um, and certain people did certain things. And what I did at Texas School Book Repository at that time, I was an order filler and um, I would take the orders out of the, the box and I would go wherever I need to go in the building anywhere from the basement to the seventh floor which you're sitting in here today this is the seventh floor um, and the publications we had in here did not sell as well as the ones on uh, the basement uh, the first floor the uh, second floor was offices third was offices fourth was part office and part warehouse for uh, pallets of textbooks. And I would go wherever the uh, uh, order asked me. And by the way, uh, I filled orders for, uh, we filled orders for five states. We could do more, but we, we did five states basically. It was uh, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And if you have a child going to uh, school here in Texas, uh, say take an algebra one. Let's go. Let's see. Uh, say algebra one. This uh, any subject. Well, some states they adopt uh, certain texts to be used in their schools. And I know, uh, for instance, uh, some textbooks were used in the Texas schools were not used in, say, like Arkansas. And you had to know where to look at the book or on the outside of the case to determine uh, which product you were picking up. And the goal is to fill the orders as uh, quickly as possible, but the main thing was to be accurate. Because uh, if you make a mistake, uh, the 
uh, school didn't get the textbook that I needed. So they had to ship it back. It cost a lot of time and it cost money. So uh, we did the best we could efficiently as we could. And uh, we did this all day long. Uh, some orders were small uh, that would uh, be shipped by the uh, uh, United States Postal System. At that time, we didn't have FedEx and UPS down here. All we had was the post office, and we used to uh, take a truck over to the uh, post office here in Dallas, which was right, uh, if you go out the front door of the uh, school book, depository building here, and look directly across, you'll see a large uh, light-colored building, and that was the post office there. And that's where we used to take the uh, packages that were to be shipped, uh, what I call parcel posts, small packages. And we'd take those over there every afternoon and uh, deliver them there, and then they would ship them to wherever they needed to go. And the other orders were what we call freight orders. Um, that might be anything from four or five cases of books, and it didn't have to be all one publisher. Uh, when you fill an order, you might, uh, you might feel uh, the school might be asking for say like uh, 30 copies, well maybe there was only 22 cases to a, uh, copies to a case. So you'd pull, uh, you'd pull a case and then you'd have eight loose. Well, Mr. Shelley was a checker. And then we had people like uh, Eddie Piper who would uh, help us. He would pack a lot of the freight orders. Um, now, come mid-October, a young man started working here by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. And Oswald uh, found out about the opening here at the Texas School Book Depository really because of you. Tell us that story. Well, the way that happened was that my sister used to the area there in Irving where they lived. Uh, some of the ladies used to get together oh, several times a week and they would have coffee and some type of uh, coffee cake or whatever pastries they had. And they'd sit around and they'd talk about their day and what was going on in their lives and so forth. Um, and I had been working quite a bit of overtime and uh, Miss Payne, they were at Miss Payne's house and that's where uh, Lee's wife, Marina, and their oldest child was uh, living at the time being. And she said, well, uh, she told all the ladies there, she said, uh, Marina's husband is uh, looking for work. He's out of work. And my sister said, well, my brother has been working a lot of overtime. And she said, I'll ask him if they're, they're still hiring. So she asked me one day when I come in, she said, are they doing any hiring at Texas School Bucks? I said, I don't know, but I said, I'll check and find out. Well, the very next day, I asked Mr. Uh, Shelley, I said, are we doing any hiring? I said, there's a woman living out uh, with a family in Irving and her husband's looking for work. And, and he said, well, let me check and see. Well, he checked with Mr. Truly and it wasn't very long. He come back and he told me, he says, uh, how the man come by and fill out an application? Well, Lee did come to Texas School Book. He filled out the application, and, uh, and they hired him. And the first time that that I met Lee was in front of Mr. Shelley's office. As a matter of fact, I was somewhere in the building. We had five speakers that they could talk to you or call you anywhere in the building in the warehouse and so I was doing something and he said uh, I need you to come to my office so I uh, I did that and when I was approaching his office uh, Mr. Bill Shelley was um, standing there and he had a man with him and he walked up and he said uh, I went by that and then I went by Wesley and he said Wesley he said this is uh, a leap he said I want you to take him and teach him how to fill orders. And from, I said, okay. And so I told him what I was doing. I said, well, I'm currently working on order I already started. I said, come and you can, uh, you can finish that with me. And I, tell, I explained to him that down on the first floor that we had some uh, bins. And I said, uh, that's where we keep, if we need, say, like three copies, we go to the bins and get them on the first floor. But I said, if we need two cases, I said we go upstairs and, and uh, take them off the floor that they're being stored on. And uh, 
Lee was a Lee was a man that didn't talk a whole lot, um, but if you asked him something, he would he would answer you. Um, he was a he was a very dedicated uh, person. He learned very quickly, and I like that because that way I've always whatever I'm doing. If I'm teaching somebody something, I feed it to them as fast as as they can absorb it. Um, if you've ever been in a position where you do that and you work with different people, uh, you learn it very quickly. Some will learn it at a much faster pace than others. But, um, and I taught him, and a lot of our conversation during the day was strictly business. He'd, uh, he'd ask me, he'd come to me and says, well, I'm, uh, I can't find this. And I'd say, well, what are you looking for? And he'd show me, and I said, oh, well, that's over here. Well, let's say that he needed two copies. And we go to the bin, there wasn't any. It's out. I said, well, what we have to do is go upstairs and get a case and put it in the bins there, and, and you take your two cases and put over on the table if that's all that was on the order. And sometimes it was. You might have just two or three books on order, but they'd be shipped partial post. And uh, I would show him how to do that. And um, he, uh, as I said earlier, uh, he was very, uh, he learned very quick, and I was very proud of that. And You've told me in the past that um, some of the guys would make fun of Lee. And at one point, Lee came to you and asked you why the other guys are making fun of him. Tell us about that. What did you say? Okay, well, this is the way I explain that to him. Let's say that we were out on, on the dock. Let's say that um, I was out on the dock, Lee was out on the dock, and somebody else. And something happened out on Houston Street, which is runs right by the building here. They witnessed something. Well, let's say that the other person, not Lee, he would be telling the group of people there about that. Let's say they were in the break room. And uh, they would listen to what he'd say, and then Lee would tell them the same thing, but the, but the language he would use, um, some of them did not comprehend what he was saying. Uh, and he asked me one day uh, matter of fact he was uh, he said something and I didn't I was trying to put the word that I wasn't sure of I was trying to figure out how it related to the sentence and, and, and what it actually meant so he found me in the bins there and, and one of the things we had was dictionary several different publishers and dictionaries and I was looking up this word and he asked me he says uh, what are you doing I said well you used this word in this sentence and I wasn't sure what it meant so I said I, I'm looking up and applying it to the sentence you used trying to understand what you were telling me and he said well he said you're different than the other guys and I said really and I said how's that he said you never make fun of me and I, let, I turned and I said well I said, that comes from my upbringing. I said, my mother and my grandmother taught me. They taught me to never make fun of someone. And I said, if you stop and think about it, I said, sometimes people, they want to divert their attention to someone else other than themselves. Um, but uh, Lee and I had a very good working relationship. Um, it wasn't long before you were offering him rides home on Fridays. Tell us about how that got started. Well, the way that happened was the uh, first day that he, he came to work. Uh, it was in, I don't remember what day it was that he came to work, but anyway, when I found out that uh, his wife was living with Miss Payne and Irving, which was right down the street from me, I told him, I said, uh, Lee, any time you want to go out and visit your family, I said, you're welcome to ride. I said, you can go with me any time. And, uh, and then a few minutes later, he said, uh, if he's all right with you, he said, I'd like to ride out with you on Friday afternoon. And he living in uh, Dallas in a rooming house and his wife living over with Miss Payne and Irving. I thought about that briefly, but I said, well, I don't know what the reason that is, but that's none of my business. If he wants to tell me, fine. If he doesn't, fine. He didn't bother me. Uh, so that's the way he started riding with me. He'd ride out with me on Friday afternoon, and then he would come back with me on Monday morning. Well, 
I know people probably want to know, well, when you and he would be going out to Irving, uh, we never stopped to have a beer or a soft drink or anything. Uh, we just went straight from work out to, to the uh, house where his wife was staying with Miss Payne. And the same thing when we'd come to work on Monday mornings. But all that time between Friday afternoon and Monday morning, I never did see leave. We never did anything together. Now, you may read things that they, uh, they uh, said, well, Lee and I was at the rifle range together and all kind of stories. But I'm telling you right now, that's totally false. We never did anything. And one reason I never did anything with him was that I said, well, here he is all week long living over there in Dallas at a rooming house. And he comes over to see his wife and his child. And I said, he probably has lots of things he wants to do with them. And being a young 19-year-old boy, I could be a 19-year-old boy on the weekend. During the day, I worked with a lot of guys that were 30, 33 years old, something like that. So I had to be as old as I couldn't be as a kid. I had to be I had to be an adult and I had to be focused. And uh, Lee was pretty good with, with kids in the neighborhood, right? Yes, he was. Um, and the way I found out about that was that my sister, Miss Lady May Fraser Randall, she and her husband, they had three little girls, Diana, Patricia, and Carolyn. Well, hearing little kids talk around the table and stuff like that, I learned that Lee would play games with the children in the neighborhood. And they always like to go up, they always look forward to going up and playing around the big oak tree, which by the way is still there today. If you go over to Irving to the paint house, the old paint house, that big oak tree is still there. And they played many a games under the shade of that big tree, around the tree. And they, my little niece is just hearing them talk. Uh, they thought Lee was a great man. And real, he said he was always nice and kind. I asked him, I said, you have a good time playing with him? He said, oh, yes. And he said, his daughter he said, we play games. And uh, I said, I just let it go at that. I never did really try to pinpoint them about what was so great. But you have to stop and think about a child. You know, a child can look at someone, and you and I can look at someone, and... We might have a hard time trying to figure out where they are, who they are, but a child can, a child can look and tell you, you're a nice person, uh, that person is mean. Well, when a child tells you that, you better listen. Lee, because, sorry, Lee deviated from that, that routine of riding with you on Fridays the week of the assassination. Instead, he asked to ride with you that Thursday, November 21st. Yes, he did. Uh, he came up to me on Thursday and uh, he said, can I ride home with you today? I said, sure. I said, you know, you're always welcome to ride. And a few minutes later, I was looking at this order and I was looking at the date. I said, myself, I said, today's not Friday. Today's Thursday. So when I ran into him a few minutes later, I said, are you confused? I said, today's not Friday, today's Thursday. And he says, I know that. But he said, um, I'm going to go out to the, uh, I'd like to ride out with you because I want to get some curtain rods to put some curtains up in my apartment. Well, how little did I know, never have been over to his um, uh, rooming house there on Beckley. He already had curtain rods and curtains hanging in his room he rented but I didn't know that so I said fine and um, so the next morning on Friday uh, he got up and um, he walked down the street it was about a half a block and he had this package with him my sister was at the sink doing something I don't know what she was doing might have been washing dishes or because the stove wasn't too far from there and uh so she, she did see him with a package. And he uh, put the package in my back seat of my car. Because back then, uh, we, didn't, we didn't lock cars. You didn't have to lock cars. People didn't bother anything. 
Oh, how times have changed. This was unusual for Oswald to do this. He had never walked over to your house and looked in your kitchen window before, had he? No, he never had. That was very unusual because he put the package in the back seat of the car and then he walked to the kitchen window there and looked in to say, I, why did he look in the window? Was he looking to see if anyone had seen him? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, my mother was sitting at the uh, table with my little nieces and I and she startled her. She says, who is that man looking in the window? Well, I looked up and I said, that's Lee, that's the man that rides, will be riding to work with me. I said, he works with me at Texas School Bus. So I got up from the table and I went to the back door and Lee was standing there on the carport. And I told him, I said, I'm just about to eating my breakfast. I said, uh, let me finish that and I'll brush my teeth and I'll be right on out and we'll take off for work. And that's exactly what we did. Now, you took a look at the package in the back seat. You asked him what it was. What did yes. he say? Well, as I was uh, sitting down in the store, car, I glanced over my shoulder and I saw this package. And I asked him, I said, Lee, I said, what's in the package? He said, you remember? He said, it's curtain rods. I said, oh, that's right. I said, you told me you're going to be taking some curtain rods. So nothing was ever said about the package anymore. And we, we rode on in to work together. And uh, that morning, it was, it was very cloudy, overcast, and it was misty, real fine mist on your windshield. And back then, cars didn't have intermittent wipers, so I had to turn the wiper on. And uh, the drops were so small, it was just like the size of a, like a straight pen or a needle. And I had to do that s several times, and I said, Tell him, talking to Lee, I said, I wish he'd rain or, uh, uh, rain or, or stop this. And, uh, and we had the radio on, I always had the radio on. Uh, was anything mentioned about the fact that the president was going to be coming by your building that day? No, not anything. And uh, we didn't do a lot of talking that morning going to work. It was just like any other morning. He rode to work with me. I rode out to Urban with me. Lee just wasn't a big talker, uh, and uh, and um, we're and looking at a, uh, we're looking at a picture here that shows uh, roughly where you parked. The, 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 this area has changed quite a bit, um, but you you parked your car over here north of the building. Um, it's it, most people don't know this, but the Texas School Book Depository had another warehouse space north of the building called the State that, Building. That is correct. And that's where they typically stored textbooks that would go out to schools in the state of Texas. Uh, no, uh, if you look inside. Uh, uh, a textbook, and I think a lot of schools nowadays they don't even let the children bring textbooks home now. Everything done on computer. But back then, if you'd open a book and read on the inside of the front cover, it's stamped "State of Texas." That was a state book, uh, and all states have them, with Arkansas or whatever. Um, and they did ship. Uh, to answer your question, yes, they did ship those textbooks primarily to the schools in the state of Texas. Yes, they did. But you parked your car behind the state building, you told me, right yeah. over here, and, this, and, then, and then walked across railroad tracks to get to the depository here at the corner of Elm and Houston. Now yeah. that day, Lee got out of the car, and you stayed in the car for a moment to uh, rev your engine a little bit. Tell us about that. I did. We got there, uh, and I looked at my watch, and, and I knew how long it took me to walk up to the building and hang my coat up and be ready to go to work at 8 o'clock. And so I, back then the cars had a generator on them and then they had a voltage regulator on them. For ones of you old enough, the voltage regulator used to be the little black box that sits where a lot of time where your uh, power steering is now on cars. And your battery could be hot, but if the points and the voltage regulator would stick and pull all the juice out of your battery. And so when you tried to start, you, you had a dead battery. And, uh, and that had happened to you a couple times, right? Yes, it did. And so I was, uh, I was doing that, and, and um, we got out while I was doing, uh, 
uh, rib and engine a little bit and he stood there for a minute and then he got the package out of the back seat and he walked on ahead of me. Uh, in the past we always walked together but this particular morning he walked ahead of me and I never did catch up with him because um, as I said there was a big used to be a huge railway shipping yard here where they put trains together and they take off trains and as a little boy I was always fascinated by trains so I'd uh, walk I walked uh, pretty briefly but he has to wonder how to fall in some time because I was so busy watching in the tracks and everything but I didn't uh, how was he carrying the package he was carrying the package one uh, one end was under his armpit and then the other one was cupped in his hands and uh, I know it's been said that Lee brought the rifle to work with him that morning. There's no way he could have had the rifle in that package because if you had one of these uh, Italian rifles and you took the uh, barrel off the wooden stock, neither one would fit in that package and I've said his package was around two feet long, give or take an inch or two. There's no way it would fit in there. Now, the question is, how did the rifle get there? I don't know. But he didn't bring it that day. We're going to come back and talk about that package later on when we talk about your testimony to the Warren Commission. But let's get on through the day of the assassination. Now, did you see Oswald any, any other times um, that day before lunch? Uh, yes, I did. I, I, I saw Lee, I did see Lee uh, several times that morning, off and on, we was working, but I didn't know at the time or the particular place I did see him, uh, but I did see him several times, and we were just going about business, uh, filling orders. Now, once we got to work, uh, there was one uh, man that I worked with, his name was Junior Jarman, he always bought, a, he always uh, purchased a, a newspaper on the way to work. And uh, it wasn't too long after we got to work that morning, a big buzz was on. They had uh, printed, at that time we had two papers in Dallas. It was the um, Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald. Well, the Dallas Times Herald is no longer, but the Morning News is still here. Um, but they had published a proposed route of the presidential uh, parade. They did that a day or two before, I think, as well as that day. Well, Junior asked me when I was over picking some orders out of one of the boxes, I was going to fill the orders, uh, that publisher, he asked me, he says, are we going to get to um, go out and watch the parade? And I said, um, well, I don't know, Junior. Uh, he says, a lot of guys are talking about it. I said, yeah, I've been hearing people talk. And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll just go ask Mr. Shelley. And I walked by Mr. Shelley, and he says, uh, by the way, he said, you can tell everybody that we're going to get to, we're going to stop, and we're going to get to go out and watch the parade when it comes by today. And that just, everybody was so happy about that, because you stop and think about it. In your ordinary life today, how many have you had the opportunity to go out and see a presidential parade regardless of what reason they're in your city or the area you're in. How many? It doesn't happen very often. Not for people that work, what I call common working people work for a paycheck. It just doesn't happen. And yeah, the picture we're looking at right here was taken by a bystander named Phil Willis and you can see the motorcade making that turn from Houston to Elm and back here in the background is the Texas School Book Depository. You were standing uh, at the top of the stairs in the main, the main little entryway underneath the big metal sign that said Texas School Book Depository. T tell us what, what you observed during those, during those moments. Okay. Um, what I've come to realize all these years is that where I was standing on the top steps, you cannot see me on the picture, that one that shows uh, Billy Lovelady standing like he's holding up the building. Uh, but I was standing at the top of the stairs in the shade. I realized one day that I had the best seat in the house because the uh, 
presidential parade it, when it made its turn off of Houston onto Elm there. It's a pretty sharp turn there. And so the limousine had to slow down. And, it, and I said to myself, the pictures of John Kennedy and Jackie that I had seen in Life magazines and things, I said, the photography of those photographers is exceptional. Because I could relate looking at the picture at them present to the pictures I'd seen in magazines. And, and, and it was it was something that I will never forget. As a matter of fact, I was down here in Daly Plaza not too long ago, and I had a young man with me, and I asked him, I said, I want to show you something. So we walked up the front of the steps here, and I said, I want you to stand right here. And I said, now you visualize the presidential parade, and you're standing right there. I said, what do you think about that view? And he thought it was priceless. I don't have any pictures that I can show you, but I have pictures in my mind, and it was, it was, and I realized, but I didn't realize how great it was until some years later. That what a wonderful opportunity. How, how many shots did you hear? I shots. I heard three, and in that presidential parade there were it was being led by uh, and there was motorcycle policemen and these motorcycle policemen were cutting their motorcycles on and off if you know anything or you ride motorcycles you know you can do that and they'll make them backfire well they were very close to getting on to Stemmons to go out to where uh, the president was going to speak and so when the first shot occurred, I thought it was just a motorcycle backfire. I think it wasn't long after that. There was two, in the, and the two was in closer in, in succession than the, between the first and second. And then I realized that that wasn't motorcycle, motorcycle backfire. It was somebody shooting a weapon. And it was down here in Dealey Plaza, it was total chaos. People was running and screaming and falling down and hollering. You didn't know what was going on. And did, did you get a sense from where you were standing at the top of the steps where those shots were coming from? Well, the first one, um, the first one, from where I was standing back on top of the step, it sounded like it come to my right down where the motorcade was. But then the second and third sounded closer, much closer. And I know if you are out here with the acoustics of the buildings, the way they're around, the sound bouncing off one building onto the other might give you the impression that there's, there were more shots fired than there were. Um, In the chaos that followed the, uh, the shooting, did you, did you see Oswald at all? I did. Um, this was a small, I don't know exactly how many minutes later, but the lady I was standing next to, um, some of the people, Bill Shelley and uh, Mr. Uh, Billy Lovelace, right, they went down toward the triple underpass because before they went down there, a lady come by, a woman came by, and she was crying, and she said, somebody has shot the president. And so we looked bewildered. Mm -hmm. And I turned to Sarah and she said, she said somebody shot the president. I said, I, I thought that's what she said. She said, that's it. she did say that. So we stood there for a few minutes and, and I walked down to the first step where Billy was standing down there at the bottom of the steps. And I looked around and it was just total chaos there and then from there I uh, I started to go down to see if I could find um, Bill Shelley and Billy Lovelady 
There was so much chaos down there. I said, well, I better go back to where I go back to the steps. And I, and I did. I walked back to, to the bottom of the steps. And then I walked out to the corner of the building right there where Houston comes up beside the building. And I was talking to someone. It was a lady. And I looked. in my lap and come walking along the side of the Texas School Book building was Lee Oswald. Walking along this side of the building? Yes. Houston Street? Yes, Houston Street. So he'd, he'd come around from off the dock there. And so he, he walks up and I'm talking to this lady. He didn't say anything. And uh, he crosses Houston I watch him cross Houston as I was talking to the lady. He gets over to the other side of Houston and then he crosses Elm. And somebody said something to me and I turned and he was about halfway across the street. And when I turned back, he was gone in the crowd. I don't know what happened to him. But I didn't worry too much about that because um, there were several places around there that you could go and eat a sandwich. And I remember asking him that morning when he was riding in with me, I said, Where's your lunch? He said, oh, I'm going to buy it off the truck today. I said, okay. Well, I didn't think about what he told me about buying it off the truck. He said, uh, I'm going to buy his lunch. He said, I'll just buy my lunch today. And I, uh, I don't like to use the word assume, but I thought he was talking about the catering truck. But it and worked. There's no doubt in your mind that this was Lee Harvey Oswald. There it was. Could you see the expression on his face? Is there anything you can tell us about the way he looked? Um, there was nothing different about Lee. The expression on his face was... Um, he, looked, he looked perfectly normal. And that's the last time that um, I remember seeing him. You, uh, you then went down to the basement and had your own lunch that day. And then there was an employee roll call. Oswald was missing. Yes. And then... Take us, take us further on. I know you went to the hospital that day. Your father-in-law was sick and he was in the hospital. And while you were there at the hospital, some uh, law officials came to see you. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, well, when they dismissed us after the roll call, um, I looked at my watch and I said, well, I'll go by and see. It was my stepfather. Um, he and my mother were up visiting my sister and brother-in-law and the children and so I said well I'll just stop by and see him and this hospital in Irving was at um, Irving Boulevard in Pioneer it used to be called Pioneer Medical Center or, or Pioneer, Pioneer Hospital I, I, <coughs> excuse me I don't remember exactly what it was called but I know it was a medical center and that's where he was and I had stopped by there to see him and I was there a short time and one of the nurses was, she told me to, and she knows how to watch. She says, count the drops per minute. I'll be back in just a minute. And so I was watching, counting the drops, watching my watch. And so uh, they got a phone call and I asked, uh, answered it. And, and so the lady says, um, there's some uh, people here to see you out the front desk wants to talk to you and I said well I said just pass them through here to the room I said I'm happy to nurse them something she says well I'm new I really don't know how to do that she says you need to come to the nurses station here and uh, I told her I said okay I'll be there well when I opened the door I was met uh, by two um, detectives Detective Rose and Detective Stovall. Well, they put me up against the wall rather briskly and quickly. And I was totally shocked. I said, what's going on here? I said, what are you doing this? And they said, well, and they said, we're arresting you. And I said, for what? And they told me that they would take me downtown to question me about they find out what I knew about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Well, we got out to their car and uh, 
we went over to my sister's house and uh, at that time I had a, a British Enfield 303 rifle that I that I'd purchased mail order now to use to hunt deer with and then I had a uh, double barrel shotgun it's a Stevens 1891 double barrel had 36 inch barrels on it it's a collector's item today um, so they confiscated that and it confiscated uh, my what rounds I had and then we uh, stopped by the um, urban police department and they talked with I went in with them and they talked to some sergeant in there I'm sorry I don't remember his name but uh, they did this kind of a it was more or less like a courtesy call and I told him what they were doing and so he said fine so we got in the car and they took me down to the police station at uh, Harwood Street uh, here in Dallas and I, I thought I would be out there very quickly because I knew him. I said I haven't done anything I said I don't know what these guys want but I said hopefully I'll be out here pretty quick well, how little did I know I'd be there for a very long time we have some film of you and your sister in the hallway let's take a quick look at that uh, it's very short just a few seconds but uh, we're gonna see your sister first and then the camera's gonna gonna pause on you Buell and it's important to remember you were just 19 years old when this all happened yes a young 19 I can imagine how frightened you must have been with all of this all these cameras there you are you got your future farmers of America jacket on yeah. right? <laughs> and they subjected you to some pretty rigorous interrogations yes. tell us about the technique they used when they questioned you well detective Rowe and detective Stovall the two uh, detectives that picked me up out at the hospital um, they were the first ones to question me and um, I was sitting in a chair kind of like a little desk made in between the wall it was, it was a board it wasn't a desk and I had to look right straight into a, a blank wall and um, I couldn't look sideways uh, to answer them I had talking to the wall and this went on for a couple of hours uh, and then I guess they got thirsty and tired and so they took a break well they uh, left and two more come in and went over the same thing over and over and over and so I was saying to myself I said what is it you guys what, why can't they accept what I'm telling them and then they left and um, I think another set come in and they drilled me just like the others before and then finally Detective Rose and Detective Stovall came back and we had another round session and uh, so I told, asked Detective Rose and Detective Stovall, I said I've been here a long time, I said I'm thirsty I said, can I have some water? And you know these styrofoam cups you see a lot of companies have they have little styrofoam cups they're not very large well that's what I got that's what they brought me the water in it wasn't full and uh, but when I asked them they said well we'll check and see if you can have some water I said well I said I'm getting very thirsty I said I need some water and they let me have the water and um we went around another round of questioning for quite some time and and they had talked to Captain Will Fritz he was head of um, he was head of homicide and uh, they had tried to explain to him that this kid is telling us everything he knows so um, but Captain Will Fritz would not buy that he would not accept that so uh, they go out of the room and 
in comes Captain Will Fritz, whom I'd never seen in my life, never talked to. He brought in a typed statement. And he had a pen. He, he says, here, sign this. He gave me a pen and I started reading it. Well, it wanted me to confess to being part of or having knowledge of um, the assassination of John L. Kennedy. Uh, I read about two sentences of that and I looked at him and I said, that's ludicrous. I said, I'm not signing that. So he drew his hand back to hit me and I did my arm up like this because he was over here like you are, Stephen. And, uh, and I told him, I said, he got very red-faced. He wasn't a real big man for his physical stature, but he had a, I, I hear he had a temper. Anyway, he, uh, I told him, I said, you know, I know this policeman outside the door. And I said, before they get in there, you and I are going to have a hell of a fight. And I said, I'm going to get a good lick or two in on you. And I said, you'll remember me. Well, he snatched up the paper and the pen and walked out the room. And I never did see him again, ever. But here's the thing I don't understand. I never had been in any trouble as a young boy growing up. But the way he treated me, and the way he tried to get me to sign that statement, we could never be friends. Uh, Quite an ordeal for you to go through. Yes, and I like to explain something to people. Here you, might, here you have a young boy, he's 19 years old, and he comes from a small town. A small town anywhere USA, but this is small town Texas, and um, he wasn't worldly. He hadn't been a lot of places. He never had been on a plane, go somewhere. He really didn't know very much. He was just a kid, and he was taught that everybody's your friend, and what everybody says is the truth until they prove to you that you can no longer believe them. That's the way I was then. But not anymore. Um, and I know sometimes it may be hard for someone to understand how you could be so naive and how you could be into something. Well, all I ask somebody to do, I says, just walk. just walk a few miles in my moccasins and I think you will be able to see and understand something maybe you never did before uh -huh. if you have questions for Mr. Frazier if you'll pass those to the ends of your rows we will collect those and go through as many as we can um, Buell you did get to go on an airplane for the very first time when you testified to the Warren Commission 1964 and they questioned you at length about the uh, package that you saw Oswald carrying that day. We have a picture of it uh, being taken out of the Texas School Book Depository. Um, now, now, Buell, of course, uh, it's, it's well known. You remember the package being about two feet, give or take a couple of inches, and yet the... Um, the rifle itself, the man that Kirk Arcano found in this building, disassembled, would still be about 35 inches. So this is a, a significant difference, 7 to 10 inches difference. Uh, over the years, over the half century, how do you justify in your mind the, the discrepancies between these, these measurements? How do you make sense of it? Well, I've tried to do this, and I remember uh, several years I worked uh, for a company called History of America Tours. It's right here in Dallas, and um, and at the last uh, one that we worked together, uh, a man by the name of Josiah Thompson, he had purchased somewhere, uh, somehow he had purchased uh, this Italian rifle, and we were looking at it, and if you if you we did not disassemble it. We measured the stock and we measured the barrel. 
and it's no way it would fit in this package that they have put in the Warren Commission and they have sold America and the world on. It would no longer, it would not fit in there. It's not feasible. The only way it would fit in there was you would have to take it to a gunsmith and they'd have to alter it where you could break it down and screw it together. And the rifle they found in this building was not like that. So it didn't fit in there. How it got in here, I don't know. And I don't think a lot of people know. Uh, I think they used the word that I don't like, assume. And when I was at the Warren Commission, Report. I mean, up in Washington D.C., I like you said, I did get to take my first plane ride, and I said to myself before I got down, if this is what riding in a plane is all about, they can have it, because <laughs> because we didn't have. They weren't a jet. It was an old prop, and for ones of you who have uh, ridden in props where uh, you hit the air pocket, you may jump up a hundred feet, two hundred feet, and then all of a sudden. You drop down 200 feet, 100 feet, otherwise your, your stomach goes up in your, uh, your mouth. And, uh, but I, I got through that and I learned to fly. I think it's, I think it's great. I love to fly. It's, uh, it's, just like a, it's just like a bird. You see things and you move along and see so many things. It's, it's a wonderful experience. And I'm sure so many of you have flown a lot of places and done a lot of things. But for this young boy that had never been anywhere, it wasn't worldly. And I'm going to tell you something that you won't find in the um, in the Warren Commission report. The way I conversed back in those days, my grammar that I used, is terrible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, but that's the way... I converse. That's the way I talk to someone. So I can't hide that. What I have, what I have, I have improved my English uh, somewhat. But every now and then, I still make a grammar error. But I was telling somebody one day, if I was investigating this at that time, what I would be looking for was the truth. I could get past where a young man used the wrong tense of a verb or something. I could get past that because all I'm interested in is in the truth. And I think that's something that sometimes uh, that I don't think they zeroed in on that as much as they should have. Bill, uh, let's, uh, we have a, a large stack of questions here. Let's try to go through as, as many of these quickly as we can. Uh, what was your reaction when you first learned that your friend, Lee Harvey Oswald, was the accused assassin? It was, it was a shock to me. You stop and think about somebody that you work with on a real close basis, and something like this would occur, you would understand very clearly where I'm coming from. It's hard for you to believe, because the first thing you ask yourself, what have I missed? Why did I not see that? Well, you know, we look back at this now. It's nearly 50 years. It'll be 50 years this November. But what a lot of people are doing, they're looking at it from the hindsight. Hindsight's always 2020. When something is happening at normal speed and pace, you can miss a lot of things. And I guess, uh, to be quite honest with you, I, I wasn't really even thinking that he could do something like that. And if you stop and think about it, Lee never went to trial. He's the accused. Now, I, know, I know a lot of people say he did it. He did it wrong. I don't know anybody can prove that. It's a theory. And the thing is, when I went to the war, uh, up before the Warren Commission, they already had their answers. They really weren't interested in what I had to say, and they tried to make me change my testimony. And I ran into one of the sharpest attorneys I've ever ran into in my life. His name was Mr. Ball, and he was good. But I would not accept what he was trying to feed me. 
I've got several questions here all along the same lines. Uh, do you have any personal impressions of either Ruth Payne or Marina Oswald? Okay, let's, go, let's start off with Marina Oswald. I have never talked to or been in the same room with that woman ever. I don't really know Marina. Uh, Miss Payne, the lady that she lived with in Irving, I've only seen Miss Payne a couple of times in my life. And I don't know a lot about Miss Payne, but every time I've met Miss Payne, she seemed to be a very decent person, a very kind person. You mentioned um, that you don't think the package you saw contained the rifle, and yet no curtain rods were found. So what do you think was in the package that Lee brought to work that day? I really don't know. He told me there were curtain rods. And when I was in high school, I worked at, it used to be called Five and Dime stores. There is no more Five and Dime. They're dollar stores now. Uh, <laughs> and one of my, one of my things, one of, one of the many jobs that I had was that when shipments used to come in, and by that, uh, at that time, they carried curtain rods in these stores. Um, and one of my jobs was to unpack this stuff. And somebody had, had uh, I guarantee you, someone knew about the size of the curtain rod package. Because when you take the, uh, they're white, you know, and they slide one piece, slides another, and when you get them together, they're only about this long. They're not this long, slided together. They're about this long. Somebody had done their homework. And we want to do just a couple more before we wrap up. Um, this, is a, this is a good one. What is the one thing about Lee Harvey Oswald you think has been most misrepresented by the media or historians? Uh, when this all first happened, the media played uh, Lee Harvey Oswald up as being a uh, a kind of loose cannon type guy. Um, and they also uh, said that they didn't think he was very intelligent. But here's what I learned in my short life. You don't have to have a lot of uh, degrees or accomplishments hanging on the wall behind your desk. I judge a person's intelligence by the way they go through their day and how they handle things. But they just knew he was just a nutcase. You can be self-educated and you can be quite intelligent. I think, I think Lee was a lot more intelligent than they've ever given him credit for. We have time for one last question. There's several that, that reflect the same sentiment. You've given a few interviews over the years, but, but not that many. And the, the question is, why have you been so reluctant to share your story? Well, when this all happened, I was terrified. And some people believe in a conspiracy and some don't. Well, you can believe whatever you like. This is America. But I knew that there was people behind this who best keep silent. Not go around talking. Because I didn't want anything to happen to my family. I can accept a lot of things happen to me, but not my family. All right. We have a table over on the right-hand side of the uh, gallery here, and Mr. Frazier's agreed to sit over there after the program for a few minutes and meet you, answer your questions, and sign whatever you maybe have brought for him to sign. Please join me in thanking Buell Frazier for telling his story today. <laughs>